Natalia, she is amazing. She is, she's, she's, I mean, we're gonna, we're gonna make a video about her, obviously, at some point. Just about Natalia Ginsburg. Surprise! Now's the time! You go, filming? <laughs> Uploading. <laughs> Thank you. <There> you go. <laughs> Cheers. Some tea. All right, let's begin. I'm Sarah. I'm Olivia. <laughs> and Hi. Uh, we like have a mini <clears throat> sort of mini book club together. And uh, Natalia Ginsburg changed our lives. <laughs> well, you know, yeah. I don't know. Kind of. Yeah. Several, like you read articles of about people yeah. saying that she really did. And we, we also watched the book too. With the yes, the woman that said that it was pretty life-changing. But <coughs> like, you don't say these things lightly and I think a lot of books can be life-changing. But I feel like Natalia Ginsburg is one of these authors that someone described her. Um, the This woman that we, s in the back of this book, what's her name again? Laura Feigl. If Ferrante is a friend, she writes, Ginsburg is a mentor. I discovered her through um, other books where people were talking about her a lot, writing about her a lot, such as this one, Unfinished Business by Vivian Gornick, which is basically a book of the books that she has reread, so a book about reading. And she mentions Natalia Ginsburg a lot. And then I was reading other books and Natalia Ginsburg was, was just everywhere. And when I researched her and found her book, I saw that at the front of this very popular uh, essay collection of hers that was reprinted recently, you have like Zadie Smith endorsement with an introduction by Rachel Cusk and then Maggie Nelson. Who else? Yeah, um, Deborah De Lee. Yeah, Deborah. Mm -hmm. So all like yeah, all women that we've read. Because you you mentioned her to me, like you you were like yeah, you should read her. And then I saw all these names on the back. And I was like, <laughs> okay, well, fuck? apparently everybody's reading it. But... Why did it? Yeah. <coughs> and you remember this was the book that I was reading on the back feeds? Yeah. The, the oh cargo, my god. The cargo bike. Yeah. So which essay was it? It was. I think it was the little virtues. Because Probably. I think so. Or that or human relations. Yeah, but I think it was a little virtuous because we were talking about like how to raise your kids oh, and yeah. stuff. No, I don't know. Yeah, so once we were, so she has this cargo bike and it was summer <clears throat> and I was sitting on it and I was reading this book and it was so good. You were so drunk. I was, <laughs> I was just reading it out loud. It was so nice. And then she read it and she was like, whoa, this gives me so much happiness. I remember you saying that to me. Yeah, so yes. But yeah. we have a stack of Natalia Ginsburg books to talk about. Shall we talk about The Little Virtues? Yes. I'd love introduce. to talk to you about Little Virtues. Yay! I love The Little Virtues. <laughs> There's three, three, right? Three essays in particular. No, I mean, they're all so good. <clears throat> it's just... But like, yeah, that's actually a first question I have. Because you have... We, we both remember like the same three essays like yes. my vocation human relationships and uh the little virtues, the little virtues. um two of which i think are two of which are in the second part because the book is um is it has two parts oh really and i was wondering why that is Did i didn't you know? know there was two parts yeah at some point there's like part oh, two yeah, part one part two interesting oh no they're all the three like the three of them are all in the second part yeah so, Maybe it's just because written, uh, but written they're all a bit really good. Later in time, I'm not sure. Like winter, it's possible. Under, like those are like very early essays. Maybe. Yeah, uh, but now that I like looking at the title, I feel like these three essays: my vocation, human relationships, and the little virtues, which we're gonna talk about and read passages from because they're just so good. They're. Yeah, they're the essays that I feel are the most touching because Little Little Virtues and Human Relationships is really, um, well, it's really general. Like, like she, she reaches across time to talk about subjects that are kind of, that matter to us. Yeah. Who said that this is the best self-help book that I've read? Jonathan Stephan uh, Four said it, like, <clears throat> the I, one I talked to you about every, when <laughs> high school we all went through this way. 
the smartest self help book I've ever read. So yeah, Which she is talks. True. Yeah, it's it is think, true. Yeah. Like I've I've read, like so many of the things that she writes about, particularly in. The Little Virtues, actually The Little Virtues taught me stuff that I didn't even really conceive before. Yeah, because it's like all things that we we experience but we don't really have the words and yeah. she seems to have words for everything. That was she, the first yeah. thing that I noticed, even in like The Dry Heart, which is a novel, which is very like... That's true. It's like a... we will talk about it later, but it's like a bit like a, a thriller, so it's mm -hmm. not really something that happens in our daily life and still I was like, oh my god, yeah, I know what she's... Yeah feeling like yeah and I feel like it's also because she has this way of writing so she has a very like her prose is so you know minimalist it's like mm -hmm. it doesn't it doesn't go into flourishes and yet there are some beautiful sentences yeah. that are, are just magnificent because of their either their universality or the authority that emanates when you read them from Natalia Ginsburg's voice um, in which She knows she just lays it out like that. She just says it yeah. as it is. Yeah. So, for example, I'm going to read the first paragraph of The Little Virtues just mm -hmm. to exemplify. So, The Little Virtues is the last essay of this collection, which carries its title. And it's basically about what we should teach our kids. As far as the education of children is concerned, I think they should be taught not the little virtues, but the great ones. Not thrift, but generosity and an indifference to money, not caution, but courage and a contempt for danger, nor shrewdness, but frankness and a love of truth, not tact, but love for one's neighbor and self-denial, not a desire for success, but a desire to be and to know. Yeah. I wish she was my grandma. <laughs> <laughs> I have a great grandma though. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case. <laughs> but yes, it, that sure, her voice is really like this is how it is, and but you can also see like how it evolves as well in the collection. The way she talks about writing in um, my vocation, mm -hmm. my vocation, she says that for her it's like the most comfortable thing in life, where she feels like totally at ease, even though she knows she like she's not the greatest writer or anything. She's not. That's not something that in her head she's just like this is where I am most comfortable this is what I need to be doing and you can really read that I think like mm -hmm. in the in the way she yeah she it just lays it down simple eloquence like her thoughts stream directly into the right words something that I struggle with so often she's like yeah it feels like she <clears throat> doesn't really overthink what she no. writes and that's something you know when they say that you would find in Natalia Ginsburg a mentor I think it's true in that way, especially when she writes about writing in her mm -hmm. essay on vo my vocation. She says this thing that I was like, man, that is the complete opposite from me, you know, because it's like she says at some point something about not really caring what other writers write. Well, I have mm -hmm. a bit of the opposite, like I'm constantly, I don't know if it's because I'm learning by you know through reading learning to write through reading to to kind of like you know they, they always say find your own voice find your own voice mm -hmm. she has that like naturally and then sometimes i read stuff like you know you don't really find your own voice you kind of construct it but then you know you're confronted with but then if i construct it then how do i construct it you know yeah what I but mean? yeah i think i can I experience it sometimes like having my own own voice when I'm like stream of consciously journaling and then I'm like yes. sometimes when I reread it I'm like oh this is actually like not that bad but <laughs> and it feels like okay. that's the way she's right like just stream of consciousness and then she cleans it up yeah with editing most likely so here for example she writes but when I write I never imagined that there is perhaps a better way of writing which other writers follow I am not interested in what other writers do And that was for me really like confronting, but also like, oh, so how do <laughs> how do you write then? How how are you gonna write? And and of I mean, your writing is necessarily um, informed by the stuff that you've of, read. Yeah, of course. I can like I read in I write in Dutch mostly, but I read in English. Whenever I read a um, Dutch uh, book by yeah, you know. <laughs> I can feel like if, if I'm writing afterwards, it's like the same style as the book that I just read. Like you can see it also in my journals and 
Yeah, it's yeah, you. yeah. You can, it's kind of it gets in your head even when you're not thinking about it. But I feel so. like I'm actually thinking about it like just to prove to myself that I can kind of imitate the style. Mm -hmm. But then she also writes about how in the beginning when she was writing poems that she was imitating yeah, other true. other authors. But she was like 10 years old at that point. Yeah. Or? I wonder who were like who would she. Who was she reading? Like, who yeah, were, I always like, wonder that. Who were the ones who influenced her, but then maybe subconsciously or something? Yes. I don't know. I think we'll never know. I don't think there's a lot of information about that because she explicitly writes, I'm good at writing stories. And then she also considers her essays stories because yeah. it's her stories. She says she's not going to really write like critical essays as opposed to, for example, mm -hmm. Elena Ferrante, who wrote extensively about the things that have informed her writing and the resources and the things that she has studied and what came into play in her in the creation of her characters. So, but well, we don't have that with Natalia Ginsberg, which is interesting. It's super interesting. Yeah. Um, and then human relations. But then also, <laughs> he and I, like this, the essay about her, she, t she writes about her husband. Um, I think that was also pretty much of a cornerstone, especially like, in terms of like you know what we were talking about with commitment yeah let's start with oh the, yeah with the the little yeah, yeah remember when she, yeah. she was like yeah you become it's like you don't you don't necessarily meet the person that is right for you you gradually become right for one another through That's, experience yeah. and through and this is not a new idea because a lot of people have already you know wise people People also in the industry, in the relational industry, or or therapists, relational therapists, they also say this that you build one another, and so mm -hmm. you're never gonna find the right person, but that's how you become right to one another, learning how to live with one another. And the, I thought that she consolidated it pretty well in her essay, "He and I." Yeah, I don't remember that one um, that well. But in human relationships, there's like this passage where it was like, where she talks about this okay. specifically. Um, you want to read it? <laughs> <laughs> I do. Okay. <laughs> and when we leave home, we go and live with this person forever. Not because we are sure that he is the right person. In fact, we are not entirely sure. And we always suspect that the right person for us is hiding, all, hiding away goodness knows where in the city. But we don't want to know where he is hiding. We feel that we have by now very little to say to him because we say everything to this person who is not perhaps the right person with whom we now live and we want to receive the good and the evil of our lives from this person and with him. Every now and then violent differences between us and this person erupt into the open and yet they are unable to destroy the infinite peace we have within us. After many years, only after many years, after a thick web of habits, memories and violent differences has been woven between us. We at last realize that he is in truth the right person for us, that we could not have put up with anyone else, that it is only from him that we can ask everything that the heart needs. So that's actually what we... Actually, like. maybe it was from that essay, but I had a similar feeling when I read he and I, but maybe that actually that was what I was thinking about. This was like, the this part like struck me the most because it's also pretty relevant right now in, in yeah, my life definitely. and it was like yeah, the way she describes someone becoming the right person and actually by becoming it being it all along like this that's super interesting yeah same, same. this yeah. predeterminedness um, and mm -hmm. like choosing them at the same time yeah it's like, yeah I think that's also like a passage to the, like you know it's also a sort of coming of age into adulthood into like coming to terms with the commitments you yeah. know the the commitments that you've made even though when you when you made those commitments in the beginning you were not totally aware no of the commitment it's that you were <laughs> making and then you have to reckon with it and i think our difficulty to reckon with it as she explains in the essay like at least implies is because like we i don't know we just like kind of <laughs> I don't know, we kind of like panic and think, oh, maybe I'm missing out or like mm -hmm. something's better. And we don't, we don't want to reckon with the fact that we have such limited time and that, you know, yeah. And once you're like, once you realize that like, okay, no, for now I am making this choice, it's actually liberating instead of 
Yeah, I would, yeah, we were talking I'm about fine. that earlier. That's so, yeah. so interesting. And I wanted to get to that point of the human relationships is such a brilliant essay because she uses the first person, plural. Mm -hmm. So she starts with like, you know, the you whole You feel voice. so included. It's like, yeah. she, you you can recognize yourself in everything she says. like Definitely. But, and, 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 and at and the same time, she, she's really trying to include you, like trying to like yeah I'm it's, talking about she's you. talking about a universal truth yeah and the way like she says that with such authority and so of course you you know you 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 start the the essay thinking you know oh yeah is she gonna tell me something relevant about my own nature or like you know you're like yeah. you're waiting to be proven that she's actually right in in the voice that she takes but then you get carried along and it's so like on point for everything at least yeah. for me yeah like and I feel like it was, it's the same for you. She describes the evolution of like from the very beginning where where it's like friends coming to your house and yeah, you hear yeah. your parents like really talking from the point like the point yeah. of view for, of a kid and then you grow up yeah, with she like evolves. the she evolves in the essay narrate, like yeah narrating. Well, it first all so first of all it starts with this like. I feel like this is one of like a really powerful line in literature. It kind of has, it kind of carries the same weight and the same kind of epic, like vibes as when, um, you know, what is it? Tol Tolstoy's book. I don't remember which book it was that started. Like all happy families are happy for the same something like that. It's Anna Karenina or something. So it's Tolstoy. I think <laughs> it should be something we know, man. Uh, all happy Let's families, all happy oh. families are alike. Anna Karenina, you're right. Happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. So it has that same like. I'm gonna tell you a universal truth about human relationships, and she does. She says. <laughs> The problem of our relationships with other human beings lies at the center of our life. <laughs> as soon as we become aware of this, that is, as soon as we clearly see it as a problem and no longer as the muddle of unhappiness, we start to look for its origins and to reconstruct its course throughout our life. Now you can see why they call it the self-help book. <laughs> it's like yeah. this is your problem. Okay, okay, tell me how I have to live. But then she she just talks about the stuff that are super relatable. What mm -hmm. was your um what was the passage that, that Uh it was the passage that I read before. Okay. Uh, I think and um yeah, because it's so relevant right now in my life. I'm going to see I just love oh, it. this <laughs> when she starts talking about um motherhood mm. and like the way it it influences like the the core idea is actually that in um as children and teenagers who are kind of like we feel immortal and invincible and then you you have kids and you feel like you're oh you're, you realize. As, you're as vulnerable as the oh little naked God. being like in front of you i remember when i read that i was like yeah that's like when when mortality like it well, hits it you. Was like, like the moment they put they put my kid on my my stomach. Like, I was this, like, this is when it immortal. starts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is when it starts, and then, then then at some point it ends. You know, and like yeah. you don't really realize yeah, that until exactly, until exactly you have that. a new like, life, like fresh life, and so you get like confronted with like. At the, it's so major and overwhelming, and at the same time, you're like, oh, "What the fuck? This is like, oh my god, I die!" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, also, but that's also what I am. Yeah, <laughs> the fact that you're gonna die, the fact that this this tiny life that you just made like the Can huge so. effort to make, and then you're like, "Yeah, and it's, it's so gonna fragile. die." Yeah, yeah. Anyway, this is super dark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, but it, getting no, but the, you see how fragile, and that's why I think like when you become a mom, you have this and a dad as well. Like you have this sudden click like yeah. oh anything can happen to this little thing like just <laughs> you know i don't know if i hit a wall with it it could just die you know like it's i mean it's, <laughs> yeah. like, it's like but you start that, seeing but danger true. everywhere yeah it's a bit and, and she also talks about that no yeah and that like, was one of the passages okay. there on the on the line you shall read um it. where shall i start in the past we never thought of our own flesh and blood our own body as being frail and mortal we were ready to help hurl <laughs> Hurl <laughs> ourselves <laughs> into the most unexpected adventures. We were always about to set up um, for the most distant places to live among lepers and cannibals. Yes. Every possibility of war and epidemics and cosmic catastrophes left us quite unmoved. 
<laughs> we did not know that they, that there would be such fear, such frailty, frailty. Yes. Um, in our body, we never suspected that we could feel so bound to life by a chain of fear of such hard, <gasps> rending tenderness. And then it goes on like to to. Yeah, I love how basically this this is the I mean this is the best essay. No, the love virtues is also pretty good, but this essay is just so amazing because in the beginning, she really poses this like. Oh, the human relations are basically at the center of our lives. And it starts when you're a kid, when you don't understand what the adults mm -hmm. are talking about. You don't even care about their language. The only thing you care about is if suddenly the mood changes just because of yeah. their moods. Um, which I feel like I've been fortunate enough to not really... I mean, it was, you know, there was obviously instances where it was a thing mm -hmm. that that, you know, fights would erupt around you without your control and stuff like that. But at the same time... In general, it wasn't like as super, like no. it wasn't daily, it wasn't, but still, like you can imagine, like she talks about it, and there's also this passage that she talks about, which I thought was so true, and I think you will, whoever you are <laughs> listening to this, then you will feel kind of relieved, as she also uses the word relief, about <laughs> the fact that we all fight everywhere in clo behind closed doors. So she says, so this is when they're still, she's still in her like childhood mindset. We're absolutely certain that no one ever argues or screams brutal words at one another in our friend's house. In our friend's house, everyone is calm and cultured and arguing is a shame peculiar to our house. Then one day we discover with immense relief that they argue in our friend's house just as they do in our house, as they do perhaps in every house on earth. <laughs> Which is like you say that it's written from like the point of view where, where she was still a kid, but it's still relevant because not maybe not with fighting, but certain things that we do that we feel such shame about yeah. that we like wouldn't only share with our closest friends or something. And then when you do, you realize like everyone's doing it, so it it keeps being relevant just in like different. And that's the Settings. best thing, that's the magic of writing. And I, I keep telling this, <clears throat> and I think I say it in every video, maybe not the, the one before, but I will always say this, but reading nonfiction, like essays mm. and memoir, for me, it's been really like, oh, so people I'm deal with the one. same shit. Yeah, yeah <laughs> it's people, I mean, it, there's always, of course, very peculiar life stories and this and that, but like the general sentiment, it's kind of like, now I try to be, you know, try to be a bit nicer to myself about these kind of things. But I don't know if you've experienced the same thing. Like, for example, when you fight with your partner and they're oh like, you know, you know, and you're like, oh, yeah, we're just... I'm the worst. I'm incapable yeah, I, yeah. Of, of motherhood. Then like. there's, there's that, but there's also like, oh, I don't ever fight like this with anyone else. But at the same time, mm. like, why would you fight like that with anyone else than your partner? Of course you would only fight with your partner. Yeah. And all couples fight. Yeah, More or less, obviously. It does seem like... Yeah, more or less, you you fight with your family when you're when you're a teenager. It's as, like the fights well. of living with someone. And I of guess. course, like we're all different humans, and we all have different families, and we all have different friends and partners. So it's always gonna be different. But I think the point is that in in the human relations essay, it's really this like, you know, this universality of of this is what we feel, and then we feel this. And I love that trans like when she transitions from. At first, we didn't have a care in the world. I remember mm. I didn't give a shit about anything as a teenager, as in, like, I'm immortal in a way. Yeah. Even though I kind of, like, I wasn't, like, you know, I wasn't a stranger to the idea of death because I was an overthinker. So, I'll, I'll, I mean, I mm -hmm. already started to think about it then, but I wasn't necessarily afraid or or it felt like I was entitled for to live my life and not, I couldn't, it's as if I couldn't really believe that I would die or that, or that I could die younger yeah, that's than my time. Exactly, you know? yeah. That That's that's the thing. The the fragility, fragility? Frailty, yeah. yeah. Of, of life, that's something that I never realized before. I was like, of course, you like you know that eventually you're gonna die and you have thought about like what it would be like. Like mm -hmm. this, maybe as a kid, I was very scared of the idea of like eternal darkness, but then it was like... Yeah, like, eternal it's, dark. It's not it's like, like that. It's, you know? it's something I'm not gonna worry about yeah. right now because it's so far in the future. And then you have a kid, and it's like, no, it oh, could be tomorrow. Could, yeah, yeah. Especially <laughs> now that when you have them, it's like the, they they grow up and they grow old, and you're like, oh, <laughs> it's like super fast. Yeah. 
it's, it's like oh I can see already when they'll be teenagers and that will make me <clears throat> what like 50 40 well we'll be 40 because we, yeah. <laughs> we got them young but <laughs> when we were but 50 yeah. they're like they're like super old they're our age oh my god <laughs> that's so cool we could be grandparents at 50 I hope not though. my mom is a grandma <laughs> Oh, yeah, because your mom also had you young. Mm-hmm. Okay, I mean, and then, so let's move on to the little virtues because I really love that essay. Is there a particular moment of the little virtues that you remember? Um, or that you, the a passage that spoke to you? I do remember, like, the first part, she talks a lot about um, how we should teach kids to... Um, deal with money um, but then afterwards she's like talking about um, finding a balance between having your own vocation not um, expecting your kids to be your vocation or, or motherhood to be your vocation which is something she struggled with as well a lot self-help um, mentor <laughs> because she, she she talks about this in the essay of um, her vocation yeah. and then yeah, uh, the cancer part is in the little virtues where she where she's like stressing um, the importance of letting your kids be who they are just be there be like a support mechanism it's like this one sentence that stuck with me because it, I told you it reminds me of um, Khalil Gibran mm -hmm. um, where she's like we should offer them the springboard from which they uh, make their leap and we must be there to help them if help should help should be necessary they must realize that they do not belong to us but that we belong to them and that we are always available present in the next room ready to answer every possible question and demand as far as we know how to i think she sums up motherhood parenthood like so well because it's like yeah. it feels sometimes so overwhelming and like so much and, and there's so much to do and actually there's n not that much to do you you like the importance is to refrain at li the right time and to just let them be mm -hmm. who they are and it doesn't require that much effort yeah to just and let them go what's surprising to me is that like the time that this was written you mm -hmm. know because yeah. i mean our parents yeah, were so not true. even born yeah where was she when our parents needed to find out about no I mean our parents are pretty okay <laughs> but I mean it is a thing that like I feel like maybe we've been fortunate enough that our parents never really like put a, like maybe like in I don't know for you but like extreme expectations on us mm -hmm. I feel like my mom a bit more I remember my dad was always like you know when I was when I left the house, well, when I officially started living without them, I was 18. So a pretty nor like normal age to live, not live with them. I remember my mom kind of, I mean, they were kind of in the dark. They didn't really know about my life. It's not like you're going to tell them what you're doing, but they have an, you know, they have an idea. I was living in Paris. They have an idea of what an 18 year old does. By then they, like you were living in I was France living in, alone? in Paris oh. alone and they were they left to the Philippines mm -hmm. already and my dad was you know he, he was up, like consoling my mom saying like you know it's, I just want her to be happy um, which in a way it's kind of like you know what the only thing that you want your kids to be but then you know how do you how do you know even, that even you know? that like I always I'm a bit sometimes afraid of like putting the burden of happiness happiness on them I'm like I want you to be happy, yeah, like, but I, I'm afraid to express it because I'm like, maybe they, oh, it's so complicated. <laughs> I just don't want them to, like, if they are unhappy, they, they should be able to be like, okay, yeah, I'm unhappy. And... Exactly, that's true, it's a bit of a double-edged sword, like, but that, but I feel like also being actually, then, of course, there's happiness that depends on the person, but, but, but like, it's not an eternal state. So I feel like yeah. maybe we're talking more about this state of peace, which definitely wasn't the yeah. case when I was 18. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know how it could be the case for any teenager or 18 year old or early 20s. No, I've never because you're, you're <laughs> I mean, I think it's also part of like the part of life. Like you go through these turbulent times mm -hmm. and it can last especially maybe these days, it can last until you're much older. and. 
yeah it's interesting because it's also like a different time like italy at that time like how did they raise kids they some parents of course had really high expectations of their kids as they still do today no matter the culture i think it's Mm -hmm. just it's just like depending on your family culture is something that you either pass on or you break you know you break those chains you expect your kids to be a certain way and then yeah and then you break a chain and then you start a different one so there's always gonna be like yeah pressure Mm -hmm. like that we we don't even realize we're putting on them what i remember from this essay the little virtues was when she was talking about money and she was saying like you shouldn't put it on a pedestal so she was like like how to teach your kids to deal with money she was like when you give them money you have to teach them to spend it right away yeah you know like if you if you yeah. if you teach them that they have to save it so that they have buy something amazing then maybe you know they will just value the the, the prospect you know, they of will like, yeah they will value like yeah. owning something or like an object and then they will realize the emptiness mm-hmm. if they saved so long and then they buy something and it just like values the wrong things it's and this was like for me this was kind of a new concept but then I, mm-hmm. I thought about it and I was like whoa it's true and it also works for like everything you know I don't know if it I don't think it was in this book but that I had other information from other parts where they were like if you for example make dessert a thing and it's like dessert is this thing that you can only have after certain things after you eat your yeah. vegetables then you will value it so much that mm-hmm. when you go older you're like I I wasn't allowed desserts I wasn't allowed to eat so much sugar until I ate my vegetables so now I'm just going to like eat so much yeah. sugar right and and then I thought wow like that makes so much sense and then I talked about it with some friends as well and I talked about it with a friend of mine and he was also like yeah I now I realize that I became kind of a a video game addict because I remember my parents making it this special thing like they they made it such a such a unattainable thing that then when I had to when I grew up and then I had the freedom to just do it whenever I wanted then I had learned I was trained to value it so much yeah and so i was like whoa she's she's like a therapist she has this like in she's this um intuition about these things because yeah. it's not like because we we talk about this and we discuss this but we're also informed by so much different yeah, parties so many books on parenting <laughs> and like all yeah. the recent insights and monstagrammers and, like, and yeah. whatever and <clears throat> therapists on 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 youtube like now yeah. is like an information feast about this kind of stuff so yeah, and never when she talks about raising kids, I was like, oh my god, this is so outdated. I was no, I had, that's there was, but that's why I find it so interesting and fascinating. And I had the same thing with the dry heart, even if it's just fiction. Like she said something, ah, uh, I don't remember, but I'll talk about it later. I will remember for later. And she said something specific about that, and I was like, it's crazy that this was written like such a long time ago. Mm-hmm. She has. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, there are a lot of passages about raising kids and motherhood. She's definitely an outlier in terms of, like... Yeah. If you situate her in her in her context, in the society in which she lived in. Mm -hmm. Because we didn't even talk about that, but Natalia Ginsburg was from a Jewish family, right? Or half-Jewish, something like that. Pretty Jewish, yeah. And then she survived. She married... um, She married a anti-fascist who was then imprisoned. Um, And she talks about it in the first essay of The Little Virtues. Um, And so she survived the fascist regime and she survived the Nazi occupation and then the resistance. So she was very, she was kind of active and she was already like when she was young in the left wing kind of intellectual Mm -hmm. scene from her family. But I didn't read anything about the family lexicon. So I don't know if that's explained or if that's, Describe well, her parents were socialists. That's yeah. like, but I only read like the first few pages, but that I gathered already. Um, so it's also a very, very prominent theme in all our yesterdays. Yeah, the um, politics. <clears throat> it's yeah, but she also she went into politics herself, I think, in like 70s, 80s. 80s. Okay, she went to the so that's the thing that's like strikes me a bit because ev- like the things she says are like very progressive. Often, yeah, that you would almost think that this must be like now. almost <laughs> obscure, but then she goes into politics. She's like she she's very acknowledged for the things. Yeah, I mean, 
I mean, just she must be if she's like elected and stuff. <laughs> I don't know. I just know that I've since recently, since I've been reading more Italian literature from the 20th century, mm -hmm. such as Elena Ferrante, and this, and it's also in Elena Ferrante in the ne Neapolitan Quartet, which you see here. <laughs> Super proud. Oh, the first one I borrowed to fit that. But, um, <laughs> but it, she also, like, it goes really political at some point because it's, like, you know, about these two two best mm -hmm. friends. And then they it's, like, they, they, they live through this, like, horrible stuff that women are often inflicted. Like, just this, I don't know, like, they, they, they're really victims somehow in a way of, of, like, patriarchal mode of thinking from all the men that surround mm -hmm. them and how they create these women. Anyway... And it gets really political, and I don't actually know that much. I feel like I'm in my beginning, beginning stages of learning about these kind of things and what kind of like shaped our society now today, and also like your particularly European society, as we are in Europe. Yeah. Or in Belgium. <laughs> yeah, for me it was interesting as well because I had, I had this idea of Europe going through like the same evolution, like. From, I don't know. I don't know. I know that Italy was like fascist and yeah, Mussolini. I mean, everyone knows Mussolini. You know, but yeah. you know, it, it was yeah. so it it parallels with the history classes that I, you know that I've had, and then I'm like, so this is what it actually was like. Yeah, you can like the daily you know? life, like yeah. not, not these. Indeed, the, you don't have these concepts. And also, when I say like the rest of Europe, I know I'm talking about. Our little <laughs> corner of Western Europe, Europe like, yeah. <laughs> Belgium. Yeah. <laughs> of course, there are always differences, um, but that's that's very true. You can see how every like the politics we learned, how it played out, like in uh, how it would have been for if if we were born there at that point in yeah. time. All right. So that was the little virtues. Um, definitely recommend. We're gonna do part two. Uh, second part of, sorry, the second part is gonna be on another video, which we will link down below. <laughs> <laughs> is that right? That's how you say it now? Is it below or is it above? Is that above? At some point it was above. At some point it was like Sometimes on the side. Yes, here! <laughs> Can you actually just do that? Yes, I have because it's the end of the video. We're gonna link it here! <laughs> Where? <laughs> Here! <laughs> we're gonna link it here and you can see part two here where we're gonna talk about <laughs> We're gonna talk about Elena, no not Elena, uh, Natalia Ginsburg's other books, the fiction part that, you know, yeah, good book recommendations.